Okay, we might as well get started. So, my name is James Bottomley, and I'm here to talk to you about recent uh, TPM security enhancements we've made in the Linux kernel. And uh, as somebody was complaining earlier on today, apparently slowed the boot down for some people as well. Sorry about that. Um, so, I've been quite a lot of things in open source for quite a long time. I'm still actually technically SCSI subsystem maintainer and PRSC architecture maintainer. I don't really do much there anymore. I did a lot of work on containers, been an open source advocate, and recently got interested in the TPM, uh, which Linus calls my uh, strange perversion. But the TPM is actually what I'm here to talk to you about today. So. First of all, um, everybody has probably had quite a few talks about the TPM. Ever since Leonard Pottering and System D started to get interested in using it, um, there have been a lot of TPM talks at a lot of conferences. So it, you'll have to excuse me, but I'm going to skip over the basics fairly fast. So a TPM usually is a small discrete chip. Actually, I used to have a little picture of it. I forgot to put it in. And it usually sits on a bus on your PC or uh, in a server or somewhere. And it, you interact with it over this bus. It's usually something like the low pin count bus or the I squared C bus. Um, TPMs can also exist in the firmware of your laptop. So a lot of modern laptops are starting to be delivered by TPMs that actually run in the firmware instead of being discrete chips. Um, the difference between these is not apparent to the user, but it's more a trust thing. If you ever have to attest to anything with a TPM, uh, especially to the government, they like discrete ones. They don't like firmware ones because firmware TPMs have somewhat unpredictable properties. Um, threats to the TPM include what are called interposer attacks. You've probably heard a lot about this, but they're really nothing more than the man-in-the-middle attacks we've always known about in networking software, the reason TLS and other uh, systems like that were invented. Um, interposers for a TPM usually sit somewhere around the bus that the TPM is on. So usually they're hardware elements that were specially constructed. It was actually thought for a long time that the only interposer attack is what's called an evil maid attack, where somebody actually gets physical access to your computer, attaches an interposer, and then goes away. But in recent times, we've realized that even on these low pin count buses and I squared C buses, there are a lot of software programmable elements sitting on that bus that make it possible for somebody to actually launch launch a remote attack and uh, insert an interposer into a software element sitting on the bus. So you can't assume that an interposer attack is actually a local attack. It's theorized that they can also be remote attacks. So they come in two types, a passive one that only snoops on the data, so it's only looking to capture stuff, but doesn't alter the data in transit, and an active one which actually is capable of inserting and altering the data in transit, which is the most dangerous type. The solution has been known for a long time. It's something called TPM sessions. So briefly, a session works by establishing a secret shared key between the application that's using the TPM and the TPM itself. Um, the TPM then uses this shared key to derive a rolling set of encryption and HMAC keys, which means that the, the actual encryption and HMAC key you use for every transaction on the TPM is different. And the rolling is done by exchanging nonces between the TPM and the user as these transactions go on. Um, it, this makes it sound like it's very sophisticated encryption. And speaking as someone who had to implement it in the kernel, it's really damn difficult to get right. So it's very annoying encryption. But what I'm actually going to be showing you later on in the demo is that it's not as secret as uh, actually all of this makes out. Um, the initial session key, which is how you establish these rolling nonces, is either bound, which means you have a shared secret between you and the TPM. It's usually the authorization or password for a particular object. Pretty much for TPMs we use for kernel transactions, there doesn't exist uh, an uh, initial bound object, so we can't use uh, bound sessions. So we use something called salted sessions, which is where when you start the session, you encrypt a, just a secret to the TPM, you send it in, and then you establish a shared key secret from which you can both derive the session key. Uh, this is somewhat equivalent to uh, uh, ECDH uh, in TLS, but there are important differences that I'll get into later. 
And sessions were added to the Linux kernel. It took me about five years to get this patch sort of polished up and upstream, but they finally added in 610. So now every kernel transaction uses sessions. Pretty much because of the interposer threats, every user space application for a TPM also uses sessions. So this brings the kernel into line with sort of state of the art for uh, TPMs. So this is where I get into what are the actual problems. So. Whenever anybody does an analysis of security in the TPM, it's often been thought that just adding sessions is sufficient to hide everything, because it does HMAC instead of passwords. Nothing goes over the bus in the clear. Uh, all of the interposers should, in theory, uh, be, protected, uh, be unable to actually snoop or alter transactions without being detected. But there is actually a weakness to this scheme, and it's how you establish the initial shared key in the first place. And ironically, it's actually very similar to some of the weaknesses we discovered in TLS. The question really is, how does the user space application get this public key that it's going to encrypt its salt to? And the answer is, most toolkits that you use to program a TPM simply ask the TPM, give me your key, and then start encrypting anything to that. And that's asking for trouble, because if you don't validate the key you've just got, the interposer could actually have inserted their own key, and you'd be none the wiser. And one of the things I'm hoping to get onto in demo, if I have time, is actually doing this. So the active interposer can actually intercept this request for the public key and just substitute its own public key and then alter the transaction so everything just works and nobody's any the wiser. Now, obviously, a passive interposer can't do this because it re requires intercepting and replacing the key. So sessions are pretty good at protecting you from passive interposers, but all that means is that everybody who's going after your security details is just going to use an active interposer, not a passive one. The only real difference is the sophistication of the programming. And obviously, it would supply its own public key, and that would mean it can decrypt your salt, deduce what the session key is, and just follow along as you do your rolling nonces, rederiving all of these sort of keys that it uses. And the point is that just having the session key and following all the nonces is sufficient to do this. So there's no real added security by doing any of the stuff that we do in the TPM, rolling nonces and what have you. As long as we can get decrypt the salt, derive the session key, we've basically got full access to all of the encryption HMAC in the sessions. So pretty much all security is gone if you can do this. And the problem we actually have is that most trusted security stacks don't even make it obvious to the user that this has happened. All they really supply is an instruction to start a session. But they don't tell the user what they're doing to start the session. Under the covers, they're all asking the TPM for a key and not telling the user they've done it. And then they're encrypting salt, the salt to the key, and then everything just works. This is a bit of a problem, and it's sort of it's inherent in, all, in the way we've put our trusted secure stacks together. And unfortunately, it's led to a lot of um, insecure uses of the TPM. And again, I'm hoping to demo one of those. And none of these trusted secure stacks ever makes a song and dance about that you need to verify this key before you use it to encrypt the salt. And they don't really have many mechanisms for actually verifying this key, which is also a problem. So other interposer problems. If it sits on the same bus as the TPM, it can actually do other things than just intercept the transactions. It can do things like pull a bus reset. And the problem is, if you toggle the reset line of this bus, the TPM itself will be reset. You can quietly just start it up again, and it will run along as it used to do. But the TPM, uh, you have probably have heard from Leonard that there's a lot of people use things called policies, which rely on something called PCRs. And a PCR is a register that does logging of transactions through the, the TPM that never never reset. The idea of a PCR is that it logs events that happen on boot up, and the end value is something that represents a unique combination of all those events. And so for certain policies, they're bound to PCR values. If the values match, the TPM does things like releasing keys, releasing secrets, and what have you. And the safety of that policy reliance is that the PCRs can never be reset. Because if I can just reset it to zero, I can replay a load of safe 
values, and the end value you get is not the one you, the you would have got from boot up, and so the policy thinks everything's safe, but in reality, nothing's safe. And the point is, if I can reset a TPM, I can reset its PCRs, uh, I have full access to basically rebuilding all of the policy from scratch. And this also is a problem that we need to protect against. Now, theoretically, a passive interposer even can do this because all it needs to do is toggle the reset line. It doesn't need to take TPM transactions on the bus, it doesn't even need to look at TPM transactions on the bus. Could have a very simple interposer that just simply toggles the reset line when somebody tells it to, and then they get access to re the PCRs reset. Pretty much anybody with access to a laptop can rebuild PCR values because there's no real protection on who can do this, and they could rebuild them to a, a safe state and then get all the keys released because everybody thinks the policy is correct. So, first question is, how do you actually establish trust in a TPM key? You know, if the TPM tells you this is my key, how do you prove it? Uh, discrete TPMs actually ship with something called an EK certificate that's signed by the manufacturer of the TPM. So the endorsement key sitting in the endorsement hierarchy is pretty much the one key a TPM has that never alters. All of the other keys and the other hierarchies can be altered. Um, the hierarchy that you, well, we'll get onto this later. Let's, let's just uh, keep going. The problem with this TPM certificate is that it can't be used to validate any other object in the TPM for reasons I'll get onto later, which is really annoying because that means the EK, having the EK certificates alone is not good enough for doing all the validations you'd have to do to prove that the TPM key is correct. You have to do other stuff, which is very annoying. TPMs actually generate their primary keys from something called seeds using a KDF. This is TPM2. The reason they do this is because they're supposed to be agile cryptography. So when I say key in a TPM, it could be an RSA key, it could be an elliptic curve key. Uh, with sort of TPMs in the future, it could be one of these post-quantum keys. But the point is that it takes a fixed number called the seed, puts it through a key derivation function, and gets whatever type of key the cryptography allows. And this means from that one seed, you can derive many different types of keys. But the point is, whatever key you derive will always be the same one, provided the seed is the same. And this is what allows for crypto agility, which is a very important uh, property, especially as RSA is due for deprecation in 2025, and the original TPM 1.2 was RSA only. So one of the properties that are passed into the key derivation function is whether TPM keys are actually signing or encryption keys. Most keys in a TPM can be both if you want, but primary keys can only be one or the other. So they can only be signing keys or encryption keys and not both. The problem that we have is the TPM does have a certification operation where it can certify all or any object in the TPM. This is the operation you want to do to prove that a public key it gave you was actually the correct public key. Uh, the problem is it can only certify objects with signing keys. And the EK certificate is wrapped around an encryption key, not a signing key. That's why you can't use the EK certificate to certify objects. This is actually very annoying. So why aren't EK certificate signing keys? This is a historical annoyance uh, caused by the trusted computing group getting really burned when TPMs were first introduced because it was accused of using them for tracking, uh, for tracking users. Right, and the Free Software Foundation actually called it treacherous computing a long time ago. Matthew Garrett has since fixed all of this. It's now back to being called trusted computing, but the bad taste from all of this ruckus lingered in the mouth of the TCG, and so, um, uh, and actually they also criticized the TPM as being an agent in the, your PC acting on behalf of the big government and whatever else, and you, know, you name it. And to counter this, the TCG tried to introduce a lot of privacy-preserving protections in uh, the mechanisms by which TPMs operated. The number one being not allowing manufacturers to sign 
uh, to issue certificates that certified signing keys, because if they did that, everybody would insist on object certifications and attestations being signed with this one key, and this one key would be able to identify you uniquely and everybody would be able to track you. Your privacy would be gone. And so we are now, thanks to this, stuck with these uh, signing key EK certificates. And the TCG has this phenomenally elaborate solution as to how we can preserve privacy, uh, use an EK certificate, and still get keys which can reliably sign attestations and objects. And it's um, designed to allow for the creation of an arbitrary number of signing keys. They're actually called attestation keys per TPM. So the idea is that whenever anybody asks you for an attestation, if you don't trust the person asking, you just create a new attestation key, uh, get a certificate for it, and use that to attest to whatever the attesting entity is uh, asking you for. The next time that entity asks, you get another key, different key, sign send it off, that entity has no idea that those two attestations came from the same TPM because they both use different keys. Sounds nice, obviously privacy preserving. Uh, the problem is that in order to get a certificate for an attestation key, you're relying on an external entity called a privacy CA. And what a privacy CA would do is it would take a proof from the TPM that it, this attestation key was TPM generated. Your EK certificate, it would go through a challenge response uh, mechanism. And uh, if everything panned out, it would actually hand you back what's called an attestation key certificate for this one key. And obviously, this is a complex and time-consuming transaction. but. The idea is that only the privacy CA knows that it can link your attestation key to your endorsement key certificate. It's the only one who could track you. And so the privacy CA would be a sort of entity trusted by both users and everybody who was issuing uh, or asking for attestations, and everything would just work. Uh, uh, they introduced uh, quite a complicated TPM operation to do this called make credential, activate credential. The idea is you send your attestation key proof plus your EK to the privacy CA. It runs a make credential on this, which combines the, what's called the name of the key you have with the EK certificate, encrypts it to your EK, sends it back to you. The TP, you run an activate credential, which the TPM will only execute if the key that you're trying to certify is resident, which is how we try and ensure that the key it's certifying exists in the TPM. And then it would decrypt whatever was sent to you, which is effectively challenge response. You send it back to the privacy CA. It looks at the response, says, yeah, it matches the challenge. I issue you with your certificate, a fairly complicated two-phase round trip. Um, and obviously, the privacy CA would have to be trusted by both you and everybody who's relying on your attestations. So, were there problems with the scheme? Oh, yes. Problem number one, nobody's ever stood up a privacy CA. They do not exist in nature. This means that all of the elaborate scheme that the TCG came up with is a nice idea, but it could never be used in practice because these things don't exist. That's a bit of an oopsie. Problem number two, even if it did exist, it's a complicated two-phase operation over the internet. We're not going to be using it in kernel early boot to verify that the TPM is correct. And remember, if I'm starting to salt sessions in early kernel boot, that's when I need to know I've done it to the correct key. And the same thing applies to pretty much every small electronic device that does the same thing. By the time you start using the TPM, you have no facility to actually contact a privacy CA, even if one happened to exist. Oops. The other problem we have with early boot is that even if we sort of, one of the things we could do is use the EK, encryption EK itself as the salt. And so if we could validate the EK certificate, we could sort of cut out the privacy CA and get everything to work. The problem is there's no central authority that signs EK certificates. Each manufacturer produces their own CA key and signs their own uh, TPM certificates. This means that in order to validate an EK certificate, you need the root key for every manufacturer. And they helpfully keep changing them. So this makes it an almost impossible tracking operation, even for the kernel to do on boot, if we were going to use the EK as the salt. 
And then the final problem is half the laptops in this room will actually have firmware TPMs. Most firmware TPMs do not even have EK certificates because they're not trusted by any sort of government entity, so they didn't see the needs, so they didn't issue them. So pretty much there is almost no way of doing this elaborate scheme. So given all the issues, what I realized when I was coming up with the patch to add encryption and security to TPMs in the kernel is we would have to find an alternative method for actually solving this solution. And that is indeed what we did. So this is the kernel solution. What we're going to do is actually use something called the null primary for salting sessions. If you remember, I said um, the TPM has four what are called hierarchies, which are sort of, uh, they're really sort of uh, trees where you store keys. Uh, there's something called the platform hierarchy that nobody uses because it's supposed to belong to the BIOS which we can just ignore. There's something called the endorsement hierarchy, which is where the endorsement key, the EK, sits on top of. The point about this hierarchy is it never changes. So the endorsement key is usually fixed for the entire lifetime of the TPM. Then you have something called the owner hierarchy, which is where most keys are usually stored. Um, the point about the owner hierarchy is that you can actually change it if you change owner. So if you hand your laptop off to a new person, you can run a, a TPM clear operation that will change the owner hierarchy and shred all your keys, which is a useful security property. But it won't change the endorsement key. And then finally, they have this, what everybody thought was little useless hierarchy called the null hierarchy. The reason it's pretty useless is because the null seed changes on every boot. Every time you reboot a TPM, it's null seed changes. And because everything in the hierarchy is effectively encrypted to the seed, that means any key put into the null hierarchy only exists for the lifetime of the, that one boot. And after that, it's totally toast. It's shredded. Um, but it also means that any key is invalidated on a reset. And if you remember what I was telling you before, resets are another problem that we have to cope with. So. The scheme we have in the kernel is that we actually calculate the null primary for the hierarchy and we just save it. And we do this at the beginning of boot, very early boot. And we restore this key and use it for salting all of the sessions. So effectively, we're salting sessions to the null key. If there is ever a reset of the TPM, the null hierarchy will change, the null seed will change, and that will mean that every the next time you try and set up a session, the, D, the, the TPM's attempt to decrypt your salt will fail uh, because the seed changed, and this will be detected. So that means the next time the kernel tries to use the TPM after a reset, this, the fact that the seed has changed can be detected. We'll get an error. We'll go and check the seed. If it changed, we know somebody reset the TPM. So we can detect a reset attack fairly immediately. So we can cross that one off the list, which is good. Also, we export what's called the null primary name in a sysfs file. This is for the key we derived on first boot. Uh, and a TPM name is simply a hash of the public area of the key. It's basically a short handle for the key. But the point is that it uniquely identifies the key. Um, and the reason for exporting the null name over sysfs is because although the kernel itself does not possess the sophisticated means necessary to verify the null key, what we hope is that if we pass it into user space after boot, user space will have the toolkit to do this verification, and it can do this verification after the fact. So although the kernel doesn't know it was safe at boot time, it's stored enough information for user space to make the determination later the boot was actually successful and safe and secure, which is probably about the best we can do. So one of the things I actually did with what's called the OpenSSL TPM2 Engine Toolkit, which was originally began life as an engine for allowing user, user keys to work with OpenSSL using a TPM, and has now morphed into an OpenSSL provider with a load of additional tools. One of those additional tools actually now allows you to do all of this verification you need to do in user space to actually uh, verify that the TPM was correct. Uh, and that the system booted correctly. So it's this new command called test TPM2 primary. Um, it has a uh, three real uh, command line switches. One is the EK sign switch, which says just export for me the name of the signing EK. 
One is the attestation, which tries to verify the signing EK using a make credential, activate credential transaction. So effectively, it acts like a privacy CA, except it's not local, it's remote to your system. And if everything checks out correctly, it will validate the signing EK it just derived against the TPM certificate if you possess it. So if you possess an EK certificate, you can prove exactly that you've derived the correct signing EK. If you're one of the poor saps with the firmware TPM, you can't do this because you don't have an EK certificate. For you, the best we can do is trust on first use, which means the first time you install your operating system, you save the signing EK name, and you use that name forever after, and you hope that if somebody introduces an, an interposer, it's after this point, not before this point. But I'm afraid without an EK certificate, that's the best we can do for you. And then finally, it contains a certify command, which will certify any object in the TPM. This is the command we can actually use after boot to certify that the name we've got for the null seed is actually the correct null seed name, because the TPM will sign a certificate with the signing EK that we verified. And so what we do is we store the signing EK in a little Etsy file. It's supposed to be immutable, never changes. Every boot, we validate the uh, null seed name that the kernel exports. And if that validation passes, we know that the boot was correct. And anything that uses the null seed for salting sessions, even in user space, we know it's completely correct. And it can validate its correctness simply by checking this immutable sysfs file. So now let's get on to try and do a demo of this. Okay, here we go. Let's see, you want that a bit bigger, I think. Uh, not that big. Okay, so I got four, we have five windows here. In window number one, I'm actually running a software TPM. In window number two, I've actually constructed in Python a nice little TPM interposer. Its job is going to be to try and steal my, my keys. So what I've done is I've got a software TPM. On top of it, I'm running a, a Python-based interposer that I wrote. And then above that, I'm going to bring up a virtual machine, which will just boot. So this is my virtual machine. Um, I've got a little start. The thing I've actually altered here is, um, so a normal interposer would just sit silently on the bus. I've actually, since I'm using a uh, software TPM, I'm communicating with it over TCP sockets, and I just quietly alter the socket number so that it communicates with my interposer, which then communicates with the TPM. But this looks identical to the, what an interposer would look like on a real physical bus. So let's start it running. So this will just boot up. Um, what it's going to do initially, you can actually see the TPM thing has gone red. So we're getting a lot of TPM commands. And the interposer is actually processing a lot of stuff that's going on. Uh, what I've programmed the interposer to do is to not interfere with the null seed because the kernel, we're actually booting a, a, a standard Debian 610 kernel. It would detect immediately that I'd done this and spoil my demo. So the interposer is going to try and be much cleverer than this. It's going to let the kernel boot up correctly. And you see we've got to boot. So I can now log into this virtual machine. Um, if you look at my root file system, you see I'm actually running an encrypted root. So this is actually encrypted with the uh, systemd crypt and roll. But it didn't ask me for a password on boot up because it's all stored in the TPM using systemd crypt and roll to TPM. And the interposer was clever enough to allow all of that to actually occur. So the boot just happened, didn't ask me for a password, and nobody knows that there's any problem here. So let me do a, uh, so just verify the kernel. So this is actually a standard Debian 610 kernel. It's actually a bit old now because I didn't dare do an APT upgrade of, upgrade of my demo just before I was going to do the demo. But it's not that old. Um, and let me also show you that this kernel, 
is actually Ursus class TPM, TPM0, is actually exporting the null name. So you can see uh, uh, this is the actual hash, this beginning A whatever. These first four digits actually identify the hash algorithm that's used to formulate the hash. OOB is actually SHA-256. Um, so what I should do now is I can create the EK sign. Sorry, this is now all prepared. I'm going to just reverse through it. So this is, if you have a firmware TPM, this is your trust on first use. Um, I've actually quietly, I'm trying to emulate a discrete TPM. So I've created for myself a fake uh, certificate. And I've even put it in the correct index. So I can actually do an NV read of one of the TPM indices, which is where it's supposed to store its certificate. Um, I can look at that certificate. So this is what one of these certificates actually looks like. As you can see, I've actually used the IBM self-signed script for creating TPM, TPM EK certificates. It's an RSA certificate. But one of the things I can do with the certificate now I have it is a test using uh, TPM2 primary, my, the name that I just got from it. And so this has done a make credential, activate credential round trip. It's used the EK name as the attestation key, and it's actually done a challenge response to the TPM to verify that all this is correct. So you now have proof absolute, as long as you trust the TPM certificate, that the EK signing name that you've got and stored in your Etsy file system is correct. Like I said, if you've unfortunately got a firmware TPM with no certificate, you're just going to have to take this on trust and hope. But now that I actually have a verified EK signing name, I can use that to verify the null seed. And so this has taken, it's actually, it's going to certify the null seed, it's going to use the EK signing name to do that, and then it's going to verify it against the SysFS file, right? And what it's spit out, spat out is that I have a good certification from the TPM. It's given me the clock and the reset count, which is irrelevant information. But these are both monotonic properties of the TPM, so it's not so bad to have them. But what this now proves is that I booted correctly, and I didn't have an interposer in the boot. Now, obviously, I've just shown you that I did have an interposer in the boot, but the interposer was clever enough not to reveal itself by not tampering with anything while I did the boot. And that's the reason why I programmed this interposer not to do anything until I uh, decided to boot. So when will the interposer do something? Well, so this one is set up deliberately. If I actually try and enroll a TPM2 key using crypt enroll, and let's do it to PCR9, so we'll do a different PCR. Uh, System D is just going to try and do this crypt and roll. I have to give it my master password for the disk. It will use that master password to decrypt it. Um, System D TPM is somewhat interesting. One of the things everybody expects is that it's storing the master disk key in the TPM, but it isn't. What it's actually doing is storing a very long, high entropy password in the TPM, and that's what it's going to use on release. But as you can see, all of this went correctly, so System D doesn't think there's anything wrong. But if we go back to my interposer, it woke up here. Uh, detected the fact that uh, the TSS had tried to do a read of a public key uh, stored in a permanent key index. It intercepted that and re-readed the key. Thanks to that, it intercepted the secret here that systemd was trying to store in the TPM. So that, in theory, is actually my disk secret. And one of the things I can do is just verify that. So this is the way you verify it. You use crypt setup in verify mode to check that you have the right password. And if I got everything correct, this should be the right password. Yeah, disk successfully unlocked. So I have managed to intercept your disk password. You don't know. Because system decrypt and roll never checked that it was uh, 
just simply asking the TPM for a key without checking. The reason systemd didn't check is because if you grab systemd code, you'll never see it ask for this key. This key, the ask for this key is actually hidden inside the Intel TSS that systemd uses. So systemd was none the wiser that this had happened. Um, so I've demonstrated that I can successfully use an interposer to steal a key. Um, and I've also got a load of tools that would actually allow me to, so if you remember the tool I used to verify the null key, instead of verifying the null key, I can actually ask it to certify the key. You remember system D was using, this, this is its permanent, this is the uh, permanent index of the key it was actually using. I can ask the certification software to do the same thing. This will trigger a read public, and if you look, the certification fails because the interposer has lied about that key and I've detected the lie. So if systemd had managed to do this, it would know that we'd uh, tricked it. Okay, so final things. Let me show you a TPM reset. So all I'm gonna do is reset the software TPM. Um, If I look at one of the PCRs, it's actually reset to zero. I should have showed it to you before I did the reset, but I've done it afterwards. Um, if I try and certify the null seed again, it fails because the null seed has now changed because I've reset the TPM. And now if I talk a bit, uh, the, this is the kernel boot screen. Uh, within about 30 seconds, the kernel should detect that uh, this is, so what happens in the kernel is that it pings the random number generator for more entropy from the TPM about once every 30 to 60 seconds. That transaction is encrypted using sessions and those sessions are assaulted using, there we go, kernel has detected that the null seed has changed. It's seen that it, Based on the detecting that the session creation failed, it actually tried to do a comparison of the null name that it stored versus the null name it now has. It's seen they're different, and because of this, it's disabled the TPM. So it's basically employed emergency measures to prevent anybody else from suffering from a TPM interposer attack. Okay, and with that, that concludes the demo. So let's oops, kill this, go back to this, and we can wrap up with the conclusions. So using the null seed successfully protects the kernel from any reset attacks immediately, right? If a reset occurred, we'd detect it. After boot verification proves that the kernel booted correctly. So we can't prove it at that time because the kernel does not have the ability, but we can definitively prove after boot that everything was secure and correct. And obviously if everything proves at boot that it wasn't secure and correct, any secrets that we used in boot you know are compromised and you have to change them. Any User TPM tool can also use this null key for their own session thing. All they have to do is uh, create the null key, get its name, compare its name to the sysfs file, which is very simple for anything to do. No complicated TPM operations. So all of the OpenSSL TPM engine tools that I now have all use this null seed trick to actually verify that they're talking to the correct TPM, so they can't be fooled either. And this means that not only have we protected the kernel, but we also have full safety for every possible TPM tool in user space that uses this as well, if they want to use the null seed scheme. With that, I'll just say thank you. Uh, oh yeah, this is a nice a little web page presentation. Couldn't upload it to shed.org, but I have put the URL for this presentation in the description of my session. Apparently shed.org does not like web pages. Um, and I'll say thank you and call for questions. So thanks, everybody. So we have one minute left for questions. One question, probably. Okay, yep, here.
Yeah, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, are you willing to share the demo code? Because I definitely would like to play around with that. By demo code, you mean the interposer? Yes. Yeah, I can push it up to kernel.org. I'll, uh, I'll add an extra item in the slide to do that. It's basically, it's a noddy Python script. It's about, I think it's 300 lines long. Uh, but yeah, I'm happy to share the demo code. That would be awesome, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, we have time for one more, is that it? Okay, we have one more question. Thanks for the talk. Uh, just for clarifying the question, so you're that this address to the reset attack, but uh, so uh, do we still need to trust the device or the fast the initial uh, installation to check create a null uh, use a null area or like a, if the if the for example if the the machine is compromised at the sh at the begin from the beginning, how do we? detect that machine okay. is compromised. Okay, so the question is, uh, given that the TPM will have been used for measurements, I think, before the kernel started, how do we know that the reset attack didn't occur before the kernel was actually booted? And there is no answer to that other than um, one of the things we could do on boot is chain this null name. So we have proposed to the UEFI forum that if they actually calculated the null name before they before EFI started using the TPM, they could pass this into the kernel. We'd do our own saving of the null key, but we'd verify against the name they passed in. If that matched, we'd pass it up to user space, and the final verification in user space would confirm that chain all the way back through EFI. So we have a theory as to how we can do this, but you're right, today it doesn't happen. So it could theoretically be compromised in the middle of the sequence just because we don't check this. Okay, and I think I'm out of time, so thank you very much. <laughs>